So today's video, what makes the worst farmer that you've ever seen or the best farmer that you've ever seen? Now I was going to record this uh, in the comfort of my hammock out of the sun, but as you could probably hear over yonder, uh, there's a bloke chainsawing all his eucalyptus down, is taking them to be sold. So uh, I thought I'd baste myself in Factor 30 Tropicana and we'll have a little walk around the farm and we'll just talk about um, what I think and I'd love to hear what you think in the comments section below. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background why I want to do this video. And uh, It's not in retaliation to someone leaving some um, quite harsh comments on, a, on another channel. Someone um, copy and pasted and sent me the details of who said something and it just got me thinking. So what was actually said was uh, Tuna Lee, worst farmers I've ever seen in my life. Um, for every $10 they spend, uh, they only make six. Oh, I bloody wish that was true. <laughs> they then continued to say that we were incredibly happy just to make six dollars uh, and then rely on donations from other people basically just to keep us and farm the farm going. Also made reference to when we get older whether we'll be able to cope. So this isn't um, a tit for tat video. Uh, I I don't entertain these sorts of people anyway, but the favour the guy has done is it gave me this topic to talk about, uh, which of course I'm very, very passionate about. So first off, uh, what is a farmer? Because a lot of people don't realise what a farmer is. Now the definition of a farmer, a person who owns or manages a farm. That's all it says, guys. Because farmers are classed as working in the agricultural sector, let's have a look at what the definition for agriculture is. The science or practice of farming, including cultivation of the soil or growing of crops and the rearing of animals to provide food, wool and other products. So there's nothing at all that mentions making money, nor does it say anything about farming responsibly and taking good care of the land. But there's got to be more to it than that, guys, isn't it? You've got to make money and you've got to take care of the land. Or have you? And this is where opinions vary. Let's talk about the, the main one that most people seem to be interested in the modern world, money. Are we suggesting for one minute that as long as you make money, you're a good farmer? Because if you think that way, we are very, very different people. So let's take, for example, you, you decided to grow just corn, 100 acres of corn. So in your field, you've tilled it, obviously causing compaction underneath and uh, exposing your microbes, so killing the top layer of your soil. Obviously the wind's gonna take a lot of your topsoil away as well. So you're degrading that. You're gonna spray all sorts of chemicals on there, herbicides, pesticides, those sorts of things. So you're actually poisoning your land. So even, even things like your, your NPK fertilizers, although it gives your plants a boost, you're actually poisoning your soil with it. You might decide to put some Roundup on there you're going to poison your soil for three more years as well. But when someone drives past your farm, they probably won't see a single weed and they'll see this lovely lush green corn. There may even be irrigation set up there as well. And then when you come to sell it at the end of the season, you make a profit. Or do you make a profit? Because if you look at worldwide profits, or should we say average debt of a farmer, not just in Thailand, but across the world, you may be surprised what that is. So very, very few farmers actually break even, never mind they make any money. But say you did make some money, what do you got to do with that money then? Well, you've got to maintain your equipment, haven't you? Because you're going to be ploughing. You've got to continually buy herbicides, pesticides and all that malarkey again. You've got to go and buy your seed again. And most probably, you need to employ some extra labour to help you start all over again. And bearing in mind that year upon year, your soil will gradually get worse and worse and worse. But yes, you may well make a profit. Well, what about if you were doing corn, but wanted to go down the organic route? Now, me personally, I've, going organic is, is a no-brainer to me. Because the world's topsoil is in such a shit state, you try and grow a hundred acres of sweet corn and it's going to get decimated. And that's because the soil is so, is so poor condition that the plants that you're 
you grow, anything that you grow is basically a drug addict and you've got to feed them all sorts of artificial stuff just to keep them going now you can fix the soil you've got to try and fix a hundred acres of soil that's a lot of horse shit or or uh, goat crap in our case yeah how many tons of biochar would we have to use for that so a lot of it comes down to what you're actually going to grow and it is quite difficult so for me and Toon when we first moved here we didn't know what we wanted to grow apart from a few fish and our own fruits and vegetables other than that we weren't really sure so Toon wanted to follow the uh, Thai tradition of uh, growing cassava, corn, rice and we had a go at doing all of that and it was not very fulfilling at all although I did like ploughing the land uh, it's very very destructive and we'd been burning, we'd been spraying and it's my main regret using this, these techniques in our early days on this farm we do grow our fruit and veg we grow a little bit of corn and basically we grow enough for us to eat and Toon's mum and her niece and any friends and family that come over for a bite to eat now I know that's not making any money guys but that's money that we haven't got to go and spend in town okay we're increasing our natural resources which is a huge thing at the moment just remember what we've been going through recently with covid and still going through it and who's to say it's not going to be a covid 2021 20, 22 i think if you've got the opportunity to grow as much food as you can then uh, you're well on the way to to supporting yourself don't forget as well that food is going to be incredibly nutritious compared to what you buy down at the local supermarket or even around here the the local markets now I've been coming to Thailand for over 15 years and believe me the fruit and veg don't taste as good as it used to and I'm pretty sure that's the what's going on worldwide so if you somehow can grow your own nutrient dense food um, you're definitely on the right track for me now of course that's not really really farming in my eyes that that's that's a glorified gardener of course soon and I do have to make a few bob from time to time so we can't just grow fruit and vegetables for ourselves and, and not think about uh, making a bit of coin so of course we've got we've got the goats and yeah we're a year into the goats now and most of you all know already that um, big plans for those so yeah that's been a that's been quite a hefty outlay more than anything else really uh, getting the goat herd and the goat island and the, the housing all sorted and of course the fencing is ongoing as well so of course you're not going to make any money the first year or two or no, you're not going to break even the first year or two the outlay is too much we could have just progressed with three or four in the herd but once you know what you want to do and, and for us it's goats then uh, you, you go for it now as I predicted many moons ago well before Covid took hold uh, goat meat price is continuing to rise so it's recovered from the dip during Covid and now it's 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 going up and up and up and I can't stress this enough guys there's a lot of you that want to come to Thailand there's a lot of you uh, want to get involved in farming and uh, you, you're, you're considering all sorts of options if, if livestock is an option for you goat meat price is very very stable apart from the blip at Covid it increases year upon year and uh, now it's higher than it was pre-Covid there's a lot of people that want to eat goat that can't get hold of goat meat very very easy to sell your goats there's a long list of people the, if anything you've got too many people constantly ringing you up every week have you got any goats ready you got any goats ready it's worth thinking about guys so of course we've got the livestock but we haven't totally relied on that but well before that we put our palms in and this is well above me now so we've got 49 I did strim the head off one by accident we did have 50 so we lost one uh, you can tell the goats haven't had a cleaning up session on the climbing stuff this isn't too wiry it doesn't really affect them too much it pulls out nice and easy we've got rid of the well the goats rather have got rid of the really wiry stuff oh you want some do you minute
Always want something for nothing, that lot. All right, grass is always greener on the other side, they say. Now, when we first put this lot in, oh my God, there wasn't a single blade of grass or weed in all this area that we, we set aside for the palms. Uh, I ploughed it to within an inch of its life. It was, the, the soil was devoid of all um, microorganisms, basically. Uh, when we popped the, the palms in here, we just dug a hole, put a little bit of a poultry poo in the bottom and uh, some artificial fertilizer and then continued to plough to control the weeds. We sprayed. Uh, prior to all that, we'd burn on here. And needless to say, the palms really, really struggled to take hold. And um, during that time, I started researching and getting into, um, of course, the organic side of things, uh, going down the route of permaculture and regenerative farming techniques. And the one thing that mirrored all those three areas was stop spraying your land with nasty stuff. So that was the first thing I did. And bloody hell, guys, we nearly lost the whole lot. It was certainly a worry. And it was very, very tempting to spray them. But we'd given up spraying them. They were as sick as anything. And they were getting eaten by pests as well. But we stuck to our guns. We then started introducing our biochar once I'd got my head around that. Uh, then we started doing our wood chippings. We'd also introduced in heavy mulching by chopping and dropping all this area. So we'd, we'd get it all cut down and then scrape everything underneath. There were certainly a few septic skeptics amongst you saying it was going to take too long to do all your land. Well, we're not doing our whole land with it. We're just doing around each individual tree. And it's, it's worked a treat. So going from losing nearly the whole lot to now, I mean, the proof's in the pudding incredibly healthy looking trees and zero spraying uh, we don't put any artificial fertilizer around these you can see we've just been chopping and dropping and putting the goat manure with the biochar in there there's been wood chippings in there that are breaking down nicely and we've, we've actually got real soil under our trees now instead of just dust and stones it's uh, heartwarming it really really is but it was a bloody concern, as was the bamboo. Three years into it now, look at the size of it. It is a monstrous area on the farm. You look at our eucalyptus, to give you an idea of a eucalyptus, most of you will know, they, they almost go in the clouds. <laughs> and we're only talking about, what? Some of them are about 10, 15 foot behind that. By the time the dry season comes, I guarantee these are going to be taller than our three-year-old eucalyptus. So these are, these are about two and a half years, coming up three years. And we've had a good crop out of this lot. We've still got it growing. So uh, that's another thing, farming-wise. We've chosen things for longevity. We're not interested in annual cash crops, mono crops. We've uh, diversified. I know in the past we've probably diversified a little bit too much and we just haven't been able to keep on top of it. Mainly that was the, the ducks and we had a lot of chickens as well and quail. So we've gradually dwindled all those down and we're concentrating on the, the big stuff. So our eucalyptus has been very successful. I mean, these are huge, some of these. A lot of our building projects we've utilised the eucalyptus a hell of a lot. I think the only wood that we've bought was a donation from an old, knocking down an old temple. We made a donation to the temple up the mountain nearby. We also give them a few quid for taking a load of bamboo. Uh, and then we got a, a job lot of timber to build the goat house um, on, on Goat Island out there. Apart from that, we've used trees off our land other than eucalyptus. Of course, when the building work stops, this then becomes an annual crash crop. Most of you will know the price of wood tends not to go down year upon year. If anything, it goes up. We'll also be able to use more and more of our bamboo for building materials as well, now that these are established. We've still got them that are about a year and a half old here. Uh, they replaced the ones that didn't make it. Um, but once they're big enough to sustain themselves, then we can start using the wood off there as well. That's grass, isn't it? So there's our three main, I would say, 
sort of like conventional farming crops, our palms, our eucalyptus and our bamboo. As far as cropping goes, we won't be cropping the, the palm nuts ourselves once they get really big. They've started to flower now, um, so for the next couple of years we will be able to cut them ourselves or, uh, or gather them ourselves and prune the trees but after that then a company comes where it's a couple in a, in, a, in a pickup truck they come and cut them and take them and then you split the money for them yeah depending on how well they grow uh, they just come back as and when fill up the truck and yeah, you split the money eucalyptus uh, well now we found two guys to to work on the farm alongside us um, one of them's got a top top with a big trailer so when it's time to cut some eucalyptus and get some money for it and we can use those guys to cut it down and use this transportation to get it into town. Our pickup truck's not, not strong enough to take a few ton of, uh, of eucalyptus on these roads. So that then becomes our cash, our cash income. The bamboo, uh, we've preserved loads of it. With the Toonston worked our magic in the kitchen, come up with sour bamboo. It's really nice and you can keep it a long time. Uh, just in case we get these massive droughts again. So we had six months of drought. You know, fingers crossed the COVID sorts itself out soon or they sort it out. Uh, but if it doesn't and maybe the droughts come back again and uh, maybe crops struggle, then we've got a nice supply of bamboo. It's a, it's a great food source to uh, get you full if uh, times are a bit hard and uh, you, can't, you can't buy a lot of things in the local market. I know bamboo prices, at one point it was 50 baht a kg here which is ridiculous. Middle of the rainy season, drops to about 10, 15 bar. It depends on which bamboo it is and what states it in, whether it's just raw, whether it's peeled or not. Now, again, we're, all, we're coming up to three years and we haven't made a single bar from the palms or the eucalyptus. We've made a few bar from the bamboo, but it's just getting going now. It's not a, it's not a quick turnaround crop, but what our our thought process was, let's put stuff in that we haven't got to grow every year. I know we'll have to prune stuff and feed stuff, but as the soil improves year upon year, that will become less and less. Well, that's the idea. So it's easy for, for people on the outside not to fully appreciate what you, you're trying to achieve. So it was always one of my mum's concerns every time she visited us. She was like, when are you going to start making some money on your farm, Lee? Yeah, from people on the outside looking in, I can see where where people are coming from. But you've just got to look long term. Well, Toon and I look long term. Uh, it's the same with the lake. You can be like, well, the lake hasn't going to the, the lake hasn't made you a single bar, and yet it's cost you an absolute fortune to make. Well, hang on a minute. How many bloody thousands of kg of fish is that going to hold that we haven't got to feed? Again, it's this saying. Uh, natural resources. You, know, you could fish there every single day and take about 20 kg of fish out and never make a dent in the population. Crayfish, we haven't made a single bite yet. Well you don't if you don't sell them do you? But we want more and more crayfish. So we've had them just over a year now. Population explosion. Uh, and they are big enough to eat so we're going to eat a few ourselves. Uh, and then in the future we will start selling those. We've got people ready to to place orders, unless they've changed their mind, of course. Now, if you look at our coconut trees here, they've been in there quite a long time. And again, we did it wrong. We didn't prepare the soil correctly. And I don't know whether we should have took them all out or to dug around them and sorted the soil out that way. But now, what we've done, we've done our usual biochar and uh, manure mix. We've also had a lot of pot poultry manure around there. Uh, and now we just mulch the hell out of them. These were disease ridden as well. We used to spray these with God knows what it was. Uh, it used to work for about a month, but then I'd have to spray it again. Uh, we also used um, a homemade organic sprays, which worked. But then when you start learning about that, they kill a lot of the bugs that you want to encourage. So to me, they look bloody healthy now. You see, Sean? <laughs> I have trimmed off the old, is it throngs? The old branches, they're gone mate. Well they're not gone, they're, they're underneath about five foot of, of mulch. 
If we didn't do this, we'd have to be bloody watering them every day or two or set up the irrigation. We used to have irrigation around here, but now we don't need to. I know it is the rainy season, but we got through the dry season without irrigating these. It's just by, well, I call it our biomass explosion experiment. Uh, we use the hyacinth. Now, the world regards this as an invasive pain in the arse, and they spend millions spraying it, trying to remove it. But not all of us look at it that way. So this doesn't cost us any money to remove it. You just grab hold of it and throw it around your coconuts, which are right next to your pond. It's getting a little bit harder now because the water level is just starting to drop. We haven't had any proper rain for about two weeks now. Uh, and this, this water now is making its way down into the lake there. The lake's full, but that's slightly lower than the land where we, uh, we've got our stock ponds here. It's still all right, but you can only really get the stuff around the edge. Well, you could say time's money, Lee. With the time you spend doing that, you could have just gone out and uh, bought some pipe work, set up some irrigation, uh, and put some fertiliser around it, and blah de blah de blah Well, it's not as good as, your, as nature. You can't beat nature. So take your hyacinth. It takes a lot of toxins out of your, your water, so it improves the water quality, and it's incredibly nutritious. So mulching like that, I know the top bit goes crispy, but underneath that's just breaking down into like a thick carpet of goodness. And then of course every time it rains, it's like a compost tea going in there. So me spending a few hours doing that, it's actually giving us something that's better than you could buy on the market. I look at it exactly the same way when we pick a papaya or I was going to say moringa, but you can't get moringa in the... Uh, the market apart from the seed pods um, but our limes you know they're far superior than than what we buy locally if we didn't grow this sort of stuff we've then got to go out and buy inferior stuff inferior in taste sometimes uh, inferior in nutritional value you know, grow your own if you can now you're not you might not want to do that but that means then you've got to make more money on your farm to go and buy that stuff yourself so the things that we had a, uh, a bash at growing annual crop wise, so the, the cassava, it was doing all right I suppose, but um, it was in a, a year that just about everyone's cassava failed and they, they planted three times. When we first planted it, we were still farming conventionally and so the soil couldn't cope with uh, long periods of drought. So that, that wasn't great, and if we'd relied on that, we'd have been in all sorts of trouble like nearly everyone around here. The rice, it grew very, very well. It didn't come under attack, so Toom went in there and sprayed, which I hated, but it did save the crop. We didn't sell it, we just used it for a few months feeding the poultry. No, as far as I'm concerned, growing, growing rice is, although it was incredible fun, uh, you're not going to you're not going to make any money or you're going to make very very little money some people have mentioned where you should be putting durian or coconuts everywhere well that, that's fine but again it's it takes time for them to grow so that's nothing different to, to what we've been doing buying our time and planting for long term if you keep doing annual crops and tilling your land will just progressively get worse and worse and the land where we are at the moment is currently well, I, I would class it as on a knife edge uh, to see the soil erosion, certainly during uh, heavy rains, it's crazy. Well, I'll just show you the pond next door here, you'll see the colour of it. And that's basically because topsoil is just getting washed into it. It's like a really gopping cup of tea colour, that is. If you look at the lake, all this water is coming through from underneath the ground. Uh, it's a nice milky colour coming through the, the layers of clay. Of course we are having a little bit of coloration caused by coming down the sides here, but you can see it's all greening up now. So this is where we had our stab at doing rice and it did look pretty as a picture. Back and beyond here We've got a couple of thousand eucalyptus, 
looking back I wish I hadn't done that I wish I'd done that as a mixed forest uh, with all sorts of different types of trees in there it's not too late we could take some out but everything the pasture is still growing all in between there I know they're not full size yet um, but we grew them further apart than they say you should and uh, we just didn't want to cramp everything in there yeah that, that's there to stay um, and I say that's you know it's a few thousand trees that we can crop every year so that'll be a nice income but again you know you don't put them in and expect to make money six months down the line and before Toon and I took over this land the whole thing was just stripped, stripped bare imagine that just all bare soil and then it would have rice and then on the back of that it would be say something like cassava or sugarcane some farmers that uh, worked this land before did the whole lot as cassava or the whole lot of sugarcane and then sure enough every rain season where we are now it would just all rot so there wasn't an awful lot you could do with it you can't really stop mother nature if the water wants to come this way it's coming this way if it wants to stay on your land it's going to stay on your land all we've done try to do is hold it and try to divert it um, so that we can utilize it as best we can but of course that sort of thing doesn't make any money for you it's just another cost so yeah Toon and Lee spending a lot more money than they're actually getting in but you only have to do that once this lake's only done once okay we did it in two phases but it's done now look at all that water we hold look at all the fish that are in there look at the goats they're safe there down here you can't see it at the moment because the pasture's really taking hold but the drainage canal comes all down here so now when we get flood water once we're the the farms reach capacity it takes it through to next door well that doesn't make any money but now we're holding as much water this side as we can and stopping soil erosion it also gives us thousands of wild fish every year again that doesn't make any money but we throw them in the lake here we haven't got to buy those as stock um, we've got some fantastic species that are becoming quite rare out here grab hold of them throw them in the lake so there's a lot of hidden things when we talk about making money on on a farm um, natural we look at natural resources look how many mushrooms we've got this year I don't know how many hundreds of kg of mushrooms we've had we're not made any money doing that we've given 90% of it away well that's not farming that's not being a farmer Lee is it oh hang on a minute this is not set up guys I've not walked around here this morning check this out mother nature at her best you give it a chance just look what it can do more mushrooms well Lee you're not going to be making um, any profit if you keep giving everything away the stuff that we've had in return um, not just physical stuff like um, people giving us vegetables back and uh, cooked food but help as well some people that we've given mushrooms to when we've had the car stuck um, or we need a lift with something heavy they'd be more than willing to help us I think the nicest thing was Toon gave a, a huge bundle of mushrooms to a little old lady in the village and bless her she she gave us a little prayer saying she wished us a strong long life good health and uh, be rich next day Toon won the lottery didn't she I think it was about 2,000 baht I said to Toon every time we get some mushrooms make sure you drop a bag off to her so it's getting those things back uh, sometimes uh, we've had someone um, bring us a couple of trees you know people know now that Toon and Lee we grow organically we like growing different stuff as well so if they've got something spare or think that they um, or they think that we might be interested in having it on the land they just come and drop it off and people have found us a lot more approachable because we're sort of like furthest away from the village a lot of people don't don't come out here and spend time with us but you get that now people want to come round and look at the goats and again you could be like well that doesn't make you any money that's true it doesn't make you any money but does it make you a worse farmer I don't think so you're networking with other people that are generally farmers somewhere down the line you you might need their help and they'll be willing to help you I think it's a bit windy for me for me camera hopefully 
we're going to get away with it. So what I'll do now, I've, I've just, I'm heading for home. The goats are starting to get a bit loud, so I think I'm going to have to take them out. They can't understand why Lee's walking around the lake without them. In a nutshell, I suppose, for me, what makes some, someone a good farmer is someone that improves, improves the land. Farmers from years gone by, ex-farmers, some of them are like bloody uh, ex-smokers, they're a pain in the arse. Some of them have got some really good ideas and they've given us some valuable information. But generally speaking, the techniques used, well, still being used today a lot of the time, they're destructive. You know, they're, they're consuming our natural resources and mainly the topsoil. Now, I could forgive these guys many moons ago because they didn't know any better. You know, and the, the topsoil was nice and thick and full of goodness. But now it's dangerously thin. Some people think that it's, uh, a lot of experts think it's gone too far now and it will never recover. But as I say, they didn't know any better. Now we know who in their right mind would continue to farm like that. In the end, we'll all have to pay the price for irresponsible farming techniques. Yeah, we've got an opportunity now. That's the way I look at it. You've got an opportunity to reverse this process. You give nature a chance, you'll see the speed that it comes back. And it's almost, you can almost hear it. You're just like, thank Christ you've got a grip, mate. We'll sort this out for you. Look, more biomass there. All that took, once we've dug that, we'll throw a few of the hyacinth out of the pond and put a bit of morning glory in there. Goats eat the morning glory, so do the fish. The hyacinth, I'll just drag it out now and straight onto my palms over there. Easy. Old sugar cane from years gone by. Probably doesn't look that aesthetic. Um, people who rented it, uh, rented this land many moons ago, uh, their crop failed so badly they didn't even bother digging it out. Now I spent ages, I, I burnt it, I sprayed it, I ploughed it and it still come back. Now the goats eat it. Now I've used it uh, in some of my smoothies as well. The goats don't always eat it, but it's there when they fancy it. And this is what was happening all over the farm and all around here, neighbouring land. Bare soil just erodes. Now this is particularly bad this bit because this is from the old quicksand pond over there. But you look again, and this gets goat traffic down here at least once a day. Well, say once a day, bring them out, say once or twice a day, and they do about five laps. It's still growing over there. And this was all scraped, what, how many months ago when we had the lake finished? We had it all balanced around the outside, so a tractor scraped everything clear. It's coming back, guys. It's coming back. It takes a little bit of time, but we're not farming for just five years, are we? Now another point that was made by that fella was that when we're older, we're not going to be able to cope. Well, when we're older, I'm not planting 50 palms, I'm not planting 20 coconuts, I'm not planting, Tuna and I aren't planting another, what, three and a half thousand eucalyptus. We haven't got to go chopping and dropping in the bamboo because it'll all be pretty much weed free in there. So the amount of jobs that we'll be doing probably be the same but there won't be the hard graft that we're doing now the hard graft stuff once everything's matured will be done by other people hopefully these two guys that we finally found and we'll move on to we'll cherry pick the easier jobs like um, giving milk to goats and assisting goat births farm management you could say if we hadn't planted the farm up this way I would have to be bloody paying someone to dig the land, to spray weed killer, to spray all sorts of artificial fertilizers, bug killers, uh, it'll be never ending. You would have continuous costs. What's our cost now to look after this palm? Zero. That is zero money for that palm for the rest of its life now. Whereas a load of corn, rice, cassava, anything like that, constant price. And that's why You've always got that ceiling with doing your annual cash crops. You know, weather permitting, you know, if the, if the weather is against you, the elements are against you, you'll have a poor crop. Your soil will be poor, even if you've been putting manure on your soil. 
your plants won't be half as healthy as something like this. Look at all that mulch underneath there. Your battle will get worse and worse every year. This type of farming, you're regenerating. It can only get better and better and better. And then when you do get things like drought or a pest invasion, that sort of thing, your plants are a lot, a lot healthier. Same with this eucalyptus. This has been in quite a while now and it has really struggled. Why? Because I was ploughing it to death. I was like, oh, bloody weeds. We ploughed it. Uh, we scraped it. As soon as we started just leaving it, it started growing again. These little bundles of joy help, obviously. Get your milky, eh? So I'm not saying, guys, that um, we're the best farmers. I would suggest that we're not the worst farmers uh, that most people have ever seen. And it's still early days for us. Not even three years, remember? We've made so many mistakes. We've tried to copy other people that make lots of mistakes, which is never a good idea. Uh, we've had some bad advice in the past. We went down the route of, of trial and error. Uh, there was a lot of error. But I suppose the worst farmer would not learn from their errors. My advice to anyone that wants to have a bash at farming is, yes, do your research, listen to advice, but at the end of the day, give it a go. If you fall flat on your face, you know, so be it. You've only got yourself to blame. Can't blame anyone else. Uh, if it's not quite right, then reassess it and have another go. I think out of everything, my one nugget would be, give it a go on a fairly small scale because you don't know if you're going to like it or not. Um, like ducks, I like ducks, but when you get more than 100 khaki camels, that makes your ears bleed. Uh, not so with goats. You get two or three goats, you want thousands of goats. They're bloody lovely things. You know, so it's, it's trial and error. Try it on a small scale. Learn as you go along. Correct your mistakes. And if you think it's for you, then think about scaling it up. So we'll take, for example, this goat house. This isn't a long-term go, as you can be like, well, you should have just built it bloody strong to start with, and then you never have to replace it. This was purely to hold our girls and boys until the herd got to such a size that they could then go onto the island once that was done. Island's done now, the proper goat house is built. This is still standing. Um, we're still utilising it for the, for the young girls and the new mums here. Eventually, this will come down. I don't know, maybe dairy goats in the future. But yeah, it's cost us next to nothing. And Toon and I had great fun helping to build it. We did all the floor ourselves. And yeah, you could say, well, that's cost us $10 and it's, it's only made us $6 so far. But if you don't enjoy yourself, guys, what's the point in farming? What's the point in doing anything that you don't enjoy? What really is the worst farmer? Oh, mate, give it a rest, mate. And I even missed him. Shitty day. All right, buddy. This isn't milk, is it? It's a camera. Right, you're going to stop squeaking so I can just wrap up. So my personal take on what the worst type of farmer out there is, is someone that is aware of the negative impact that they're having on the environment, but still continue to farm that way. Things will continue to deteriorate on that land and the produce that is, is grown on there. They will continue to increase their outgoings on artificial pesticides, herbicides and all those sorts of things. Irrigation will become more and more critical as well because the, there's just no organic matter in the soil so the, the soil just can't hold water or nowhere near as much as it, it needs to. Machinery becomes more and more expensive. Uh, in all likelihood these farmers will have to then buy more and more land to try and claw some money back on the machinery that they're using. These new machineries, they're, they're incredible pieces of kit. They're so expensive. I mean, how many acres are you going to need to claw your money back on that? Certainly if you're going to do an annual crop. To me, you know, it's... Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's not about the money. You know, long term, we would be... We would be very, very upset if we didn't make any money and start, start breaking even and getting a few quid in our back pocket. You know, most farmers, they're not in it for the short term. If, you, if you're going to think, far, oh, I'm going to just do a few years, make a few quid and get out, it, it's not going to happen, is it? So um, I think gone are the days when you're going to get an absolute bumper crop 
by just uh, digging up the soil, throwing your seed in, and then uh, spraying some bloody miracle grow on it. it. It just doesn't happen, guys. So it's got to be long term if you want to be making money in the future. You're probably thinking, well, you don't, you don't bloody make any money, mate. So you shouldn't be talking. Just look at this. You see this little, you see shitty, you see shitty Dave. That's two thousand baht there. The dirtiest, stinkiest goat in Thailand is worth two thousand baht minimum, and he's in, he's increasing his value every day because he's getting heavier, and also the price is increasing. Little Milky here, she's going to be giving us more shitty Daves, isn't you, girl? Hey, eh? and then. When her time's up, we'll be selling her the same as we sell him. How much is she costing to feed? I'll give you a guess. Zero. But it takes time. It takes time. It's cost us money to put the fence up. Well, we only need to put the fence up once. Oh, well, Roger will be going soon. He's about 2,500 baht at the moment. Let us know what you think in the comments. So our comment section is always really, really chuffed with it. I know Vince on the last video he was saying just look at the, the comments from your subscribers you've got a lovely bunch of guys that follow your channel it's, it's very very true I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that so I would be very very interested to hear your thoughts on what makes a good farmer what makes a, a worse farmer because um, I've probably missed loads out some bits you won't agree with some bits you will uh, so let us know perhaps I should script these things eh?